National Hurricane yeah. Center. We're out here on day five of the 2024 Hurricane Awareness Tour. We're at the Sanford uh, Orlando Airport here in Sanford, Florida, and we're on board one of the C-130J uh, Hurricane Hunter aircraft with Captain Ryan Smithies from the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron. He's one of the pilots of one of these aircraft. So we're going to tell you a little bit about what these aircraft do, what it's like to fly them, and a few other things. So, so Ryan, uh, thanks for being here with us today. It's been a great week on the tour with you guys. Uh, tell us a little bit about what this aircraft does and, and what kind of missions you fly. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. It's been a busy week, an exciting week. We're happy to be on the road talking about this season. Um, yeah, C-130, the WC-130J to be specific. We have a, a fleet of 10 of these out of Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, we are one of the primary operational arms of data collection for the Hurricane Center during hurricane season. Um, and also beyond uh, hurricane season, we're yeah. uh, you know, almost a 12-month operational weather reconnaissance squadron. But for the purposes of hurricane season, yeah, 10 of these airplanes, uh, a squadron full of well over 100 in individuals, various crew positions on this very airplane uh, that are flying in and out of the storms uh, all season long at the request of the National yeah. Hurricane Center. Um, and it's all about data collection, right? Yeah. Yeah, the data that they collect on this aircraft, the flight level winds, the pressure, Step, uh, step frequency microwave radiometer all that data comes back to us in the hurricane center with just in a few minutes and uh, it's really some of the most valuable data we collect really forms the foundation of our whole whole forecast process can you tell us so what's a typical crew for one of these flights that you fly into a, a hurricane sure so minimum crew complement of, of five individuals uh -huh. um, and that that's the bare minimum oftentimes we end up with more sometimes it's for training and progress um, also it could be for crew augmentation you know some of these missions can be well over 12 hours long um, when we're having to travel really far to the storm environment. Two pilots up front, uh, like myself included. Um, we do our best to staff with three pilots because 12 hours uh, can be a long time to sit in this seat yeah. under some of the most grueling flight conditions. Um, you're working against normal circadian rhythms, body clocks that are out of whack. Yeah. Uh, particularly when you're on the road flying a hurricane over one week or two weeks and you're just you're 12 hours on, 12 hours off, um, which can be taxing. So three if possible to help with sleep rest cycles on, on the airplane. Uh, navigator station right behind you. Um, we've got a crew rest bunk just behind that. Uh, so we have one navigator on board. Uh, they kind of help us navigate, so to speak, uh, in operation of the onboard radar. They're, they're, yeah. That's kind of their wheelhouse. Um, behind the, uh, the cockpit area and down in the cargo compartment, we have the weather officer station and the loadmaster station. Uh, one of each of those crew positions and again, sometimes for training, we'll have more than uh, one, one of those. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's important to realize, you know, weather's a 24-7 operation. We're doing forecasts in the middle of the night. You're flying into hurricanes yeah. in the middle of the night. So that sleep schedule kind of becomes important. So, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier is why is it important to fly a crewed aircraft into a hurricane? Why can't we just do this with some sort of drone or UAS? Yeah, absolutely. So it's one of the most common questions we get when we're on the road is why can't a drone do this? And and I think a lot of people don't necessarily under, understand um, the dynamics and the micro scale at which that, that's all happening in the yeah. storm environment. Um, when things are really sloppy, it's very easy to look at a satellite picture and kind of pick, okay, well, maybe there's a spin there, or maybe that's a center of, of circulation or low pressure. And then we get in the storm environment and it's completely different. You know, you might have a very rapidly developing thunderstorm that's 100 miles from where the forecasters and our weather officers initially think that a storm is forming. Yeah. And that 100 miles might mean the difference of hundreds of miles down the road for, for U.S. coastline impacts or yeah. impacts in general. Um, and, and the rate at which changes are happening in the storm environment, I mean, from pass to pass, we're looking at our radar presentations up here. And you can often see and feel uh, as, as flying air crew the, the rapid changes, both weakening and intensification processes that are going on. We're looking at the radar presentation and between the pilots and the nav and, and the weather officer collectively making human decisions that, you know, based on things we're seeing that nobody else outside the airplane in the storm environment can see. Yeah, and that's really valuable data to us at the Hurricane Center, not just the data, but talking to the people on the plane and saying, well, what does this look like? What does the eye wall look like? What does the radar presentation look like? What does the sea surface look like? So those are things you can't really see unless you have people on board and really understand what they're looking at from both a flight experience perspective, the experience of the meteorologist and can report that back to the Hurricane Center. So I know one of the questions I always get, and I'm sure you always get it too, is what is it like to fly into a hurricane? I think people have this picture that it's just a 
turbulence 100% of the time, yeah. that you're just getting bounced around, you're strapped in and hitting, hitting off the walls and stuff. But it's not quite like that all the time, no. right? So yeah, tell us a little bit about not that. Not at all. Um, it can be that, yeah. <laughs> to right. your point. Yeah. I would say, you know, we tell people 90% boredom, 10% terror, yeah. um, so to speak. I mean, obviously we're, we're operating under the safest uh, possible procedures and, and we're never gonna put anybody outside the, the realm of the safest way to, to do this mission. Um, but a lot of droning time en route to the storm environment, often three or four hours on the front end and the back end. And, and then we try, depending on how close the storms are, um, the average is probably the six hourly fixed tempo where we're hitting the storm, uh, the center of the storm, you know, once every six hours and then depending on the patterns, multiple times in between those, those six hours. So yeah. five to six hours in the storm environment. You know, if it's a steady state storm not being impacted by land or terrain or atmospheric processes, you know, cold fronts coming off the states, um, I've had many that are very, you know, at most light chop and it's just kind of off and on light to, light to moderate rain. Um, but then I've also had my share of, you know, my last big one was probably Hurricane Laura in, in 2020, rapidly intensifying on landfall the Louisiana coast near Lake Charles. Um, and it was six hours of just trying to make sure the airplane was hanging on. Yeah, yeah, the, those rapidly intensifying storms near land are, are some of the bumpiest rides that, that you guys get. Um, you talked about how the squadrons near Biloxi, or in Biloxi, Mississippi, so you're sort of consumers of the forecast information that we provide based on the data you give us. Yes. So, and you don't fly all your missions out of Biloxi. Sometimes no. you move around to other locations, but talk a little bit about what it takes to move these aircraft to someplace like say Croy to go fly a storm coming across the Atlantic. Or if you have to leave Keesler, there's a hurricane threatening the Mississippi coast. What do you do then? That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, okay, so the first part of that, just getting out on the road to something that's farther away from Biloxi than, than what we can get to. Most of that's fuel driven. Yeah. And then you start looking at, you know, the amount of time that you're in, in the air, crew rest cycles. So all of that goes into the logistics of building crews and figuring out the best location to get the airplane. So St. Yeah. Croix is often a common one. Uh, U.S. Virgin Islands down in the Caribbean. That kind of gets rid of the, the en route time element when we have storms that are farther out in the Atlantic. Um, and usually there's enough advance notice from the Hurricane Center. You know, we're, we're talking about this days in advance, right. uh, both parties involved. And a typical package, as we call it, to St. Croix involves three, maybe four airplanes. And all in with various crew for you know, three crews, four crews, plus maintainers, security forces. I mean, it's, it's a whole, it takes a village, yeah, so to right. speak. And it can be 7,500 people at a time going to St. Croix while operating out of out of home station and oftentimes uh, in hawaii as well yeah um so there's to your point days in advance where we start planning if we have to move the airplanes farther down the road and yes sometimes those locations are under the gun from the storms in st croix we start looking at at okay what's the latest possible time at which we can still get the planes off the deck in st croix and back on the ground safely or do we need to start looking at launching from other locations in the region. Keesler obviously gets a little bit more complicated yeah. um, when we're under the gun. 2020 was a great example. We evacuated the entire fleet. Um, Multiple times, right? Times. Three or four times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was several times. Uh, we went yeah. to Charleston, uh, Miami was one, San Antonio, I think twice yeah. out of Texas. And so to get a fleet of 10 airplanes, as many crews as possible to get those airplanes out of the way while still operating the tempo right. at which we You don't need. get to take a break. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it, there, there are a lot of moving parts yeah. in play. Um, yeah, it's, it's really an amazing effort. And there's so many brave men and women who work for this squadron, not just the flying squadron, but the maintenance squadron that takes care of these aircraft. Yes. They take a beating every year, flying hurricanes, flying winter storms. So it's a whole effort, and as you said, it takes a village. It really is a whole team effort to keep these aircraft going and collecting that vital data for us. So, um, but thank you, thank you, Ryan. It's been great to have you along on the tour this week. It's been great to have so many people come through the C-130. If you heard some background noise, we had some students walking by, so they're getting to check out the airplane. But uh, thanks for joining us. If you're here in the uh, local Sanford, uh, Orlando area, you've got another uh, maybe hour or two if you want to come out. The tour is open to the public today at the Sanford Airport. So uh, this is Mike Brender from the National Hurricane Center signing off for now. Thank you.